Have you ever considered what it, is it that causes people to stumble in faith? Especially if they once claimed to have believed in Jesus. Two of the, of the most common for me in hearing over the years is that of suffering. When suffering enters, faith fails. They turn away because they ask the question, if God is good, why does suffering exist? Why does suffering come about us? What is its purpose? And another one similar is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy within the church causes many to fall away. Well, the book of James is going to hit us square in the eyes as we study it the next seven weeks, beginning with that of trials and temptations this morning. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to go ahead and open up to the book of James. You can find it in the Red Pew Bible there on uh, 1199. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, maybe you're newer to the church or visiting for the first time, uh, just so you know what we mean when we say James 1.1 1, 1 and through 18, that big number there in the book of James, that's the chapter number. That, that's what we mean by that first number. And the little number there is the verses. That is what we mean in 1 through 18. Uh, just to help you out if you're newer to the Bible. I never want to take that for granted. While you're turning there and, and getting situated, let, let's understand what we're diving into here in the letter of James, the epistle here written by James. We realize here in the book of James that it is a real book with a real context. We see here in James 1, 1, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. This is a book written by a guy named James. He identifies himself here as a servant of God, but the reality is, he's the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. He and James, Jesus and James have the same mother, Mary, but two different fathers. James is that of his father, Joseph. But Jesus, of course, is the Son of God. And he writes this to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, those that have been scattered by persecution. We find this in the context in eight, Acts 8, verses 1 through 3. It says, As Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, the devout men, buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. There's a real context here. These brothers and sisters of the early church are suffering because of their faith. The Jews do not want Christ being proclaimed, so they have persecuting and driving them out of Jerusalem. They're being scattered away from their homeland. So they really are suffering. But what do they do with it? Well, that's what we're going to find out this morning as we open up the book of James. Hear the word of the Lord then from James 1, 1 through 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, Greetings. Come in all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching, 
heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. But what in the world does this have to do? How in the world do we count trials as all joy? How do we deal with trials and the goodness of God? How do these go together? Well, that's what we hope to unfold here in this main idea. Which, if I'm doing this preaching thing correctly, and especially that of expository preaching, it's taking the main idea of the text and making it the main idea of the sermon, here it is. In his sovereignty, the Father uses trials as a good gift to lead us to life. But it is the evil of our own hearts that leads us to temptation and sin and death. Let me repeat that. That way, if you are trying to write it down, you've got a little extra time. In his sovereignty, the Father uses trials as a good gift to lead us to life. But it is the evil of our own hearts that leads us to temptation and sin and death. We're going to unfold the act in three points this morning. Starting with the first point, trials and life. Trials and life. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. We have this imperative, this command an instruction and count it all joy. That's not a recommendation. That's not an encouragement. That's not up for debate. It is a clear command by James and ultimately through the Spirit of God to count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds. But before we can unpack this idea of counting it all joy, we need to understand something first. And that's that the expectation that life is full of trials and various kinds of trials. It's not just saying here that if you need trials, the Christian life, the expectation is trials will come. And meaning at that. Brothers and sisters, if you have lived the faith very long at all, you know this all too well. Many of you in this congregation right now are going through some of these various trials and are just coming out of some of them. They look different. They're hard. They're real. They're painful. These trials will come at us over and over again through the Christian life. We're fooling ourselves if we think if we just get enough faith, these trials will stop. That's not the gospel. That's a prosperity and false gospel. Trials are going to come. That's part of living in a sinful and broken world. We are going to face trials. We are going to suffer in various ways. Whether it's that of sickness, whether that is persecution from the world and hatred by the world for our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, these trials will come. These testings of our faith will come in these various ways. So let's be prepared to meet them. But we also need to now understand why we count them as joy. Yes, these are hard. I don't want us to you to hear me this morning and say, as we count it all joy, that you're here and you say, just be happy. 
They're not the same thing. When we're called to count it all joy, brothers and sisters in Christ, that doesn't mean just put that smiling face and be false. No. See, the trials have a purpose. They're not meaningless. That's why we count it joy. Joy is the truthfulness of knowing what's to come and saying that we can still bear up and rejoice in the Lord in the midst of these various trials because they have a purpose in our lives. But there what it says in verse 3. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. These trials are given to us for our steadfastness so that we can endure in the faith. Not just begin and sprout and allow the cares of the world to choke us out as we heard from Mark 4 last week. The goal is a steadfast, a lasting and enduring faith that from beginning to end perseveres. Perseveres through it all. That is the goal of this. Why? So, verse 4, And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Brothers and sisters, these trials are a means of God's grace to us. God, in His kindness, takes us through the flames of fire, not to harm us as we just sang, to prepare us, to strengthen us. Think of a, a sword going through the fire by a blacksmith. What's the purpose of taking that sword through the fire? Is it not to be and to sharpen and to strengthen that sword so that it bears up, that it holds fast, that it does not easily break? Christian, do you realize that's what's going on as we go through these various trials of various kinds? God is using them to strengthen our faiths that we may stand firm. That our faith may not be just in the comforts of this life, but in Him alone. We're strengthened as this world is chipped away from us, as we may often think that maybe I'm the one in control. Do you realize these trials show us that we're never in control? Every trial we face, every hardship we face, that control begins to disappear. Our plans begin to disappear as cancer is diagnosed with our lives, as death comes within our families. Reality is we are in control, but we know the one who is, and we're forced to turn to him. Christian, do you see the beauty of these trials? It's working to perfect us, to make our faith perfect, resting in God and God alone, not ourselves, not our circumstances. It's resting in God and His promises. That's what these trials do. That's why they're working for our good. This is what it means to count it all joy, knowing these are the realities. But maybe you're here and you still don't get it. Maybe you still are struggling. Like, how can I count what I'm going through? Pastor, you have no idea what I'm going through. You're not in my shoes. No, I'm not. But guess what? God gives us a gracious invitation, even if we still struggle to count our trials as true. Look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, I can ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. God gives us a gracious invitation here. If we lack wisdom, if we lack this understanding of how can I count trials as all joy or pure joy, depending on the translation you're using, how can I count these trials as joy? Well, all we need to do is ask God in prayer to go and say, Father, Help me to understand the trials I am going through or have recently been through and how these are working for my good, for my steadfastness. I don't understand. These seem too painful. Oh God, how, how do I do this? All we need to do is to go in and ask. Father, help me to have wisdom to understand this. And he promises to give it to us. Again, look at there in verse 5. Let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Christian, 
You need not be ashamed for needing to ask and call out to God for wisdom and understanding this. He is not going to shame you. He's not going to be disappointed in you if you ask him for this understanding. He pleads you to ask. But to not ask carelessly as only, oh, maybe God can do it. Now, notice what it says in verse 6. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We may generously ask our God for this wisdom, but we must do so in faith, not doubting. What does and doesn't that mean, though? Does it mean if we're, we're uncertain, if, if we're struggling here for faith, that God is going to cast us off and call us double-minded? No. The double-minded man here, the one who is unstable and not asking by faith, is the one that does not trust God to be capable of answering this request. Christian, it's okay for us to waver and struggle at times and to, to doubt, okay, can God really give me this, this answer and help pull me out of this? Can God really strengthen my heart in this midst? Christian, we're going to struggle. We're going to have those moments of weakness. But there's a difference here. This unstableness, this this. Man being tossed by the waves of the sea is those that say, okay, I, I've not tried this God thing. Maybe I'll just try and ask God, get me out of this. Give me an understanding like, what's the point of this? And really not trusting God, not resting in Jesus as the solid rock. Instead, building the house on the sand like a fool. This is the unwavering moment. When we come to God in faith, we are to say, God, I believe your promises. I, I don't understand this still. I'm still struggling to understand, but I'm resting in who you are and that you are the faithful God. You are one who keeps your word and your promises. And so, Lord, I'm coming. I'm, I'm depending here that you say ask, so I'm going to ask. You say you will give generously, so I'm trusting you're going to give me this understanding generously. Christian, do you see our good God? Even in the midst of temptation or trials, He sets us up so that we can understand. He gives us the means to understand by calling out to Him in prayer. God, help me to understand this. Help me to count these trials as joy. Because I want to trust you in the midst of everything else. I want to lean upon you instead of something else. Christian, let us go to God in prayer in the midst of this. But let us see also these trials are working to overturn our world. It's overturning the things of this world from the fall. Verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Verse 10. And the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. Verse 11, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. The trials of this world cause us to see that the world is being overturned by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's overturning what the world deems as beautiful and pleasant. Notice there in verse 9 again, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. The lowly in his exaltation. In verse 10, it's just the opposite. The rich in his humiliation. Brothers and sisters, as we go through these trials, the Lord is working to chip away at the false anchors of hope that we have, the false securities we have. Think about it. While in this world, we're tempted to put our trust in riches, in comfort, in normalcy. I don't know about you, friends. I, I'm one, I hate my schedule being interrupted and changed. I like routine. Part of that is, is working in sports. You have a routine 
and normalcy of regular schedule, even as it changes, there's a normalcy in it. I don't like when it's interrupted. I think I'm in control when schedule goes according to plan. That these things are being chipped away. If us X amount of dollars is in the bank, we think we've got it good and we're trusting in those riches. As long as we have this amount, we're okay. Do you see what these trials do? It shows us that our exaltation isn't to be found in this riches, that the lowly brother, those who have nothing, are exalted. Why? Because they're in Christ Jesus. They're exalted in Christ. Though they are lowly of this world, they're lifted up and raised in glory in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, if you have nothing of this world, you are far better off. Because one day you will be exalted with Christ in heaven. For all eternity. That is our hope. This is what trials are doing. And it's humbling those of us who hold to the treasures of this world by causing us to realize that we must rejoice in our humiliation. As these things are stripped away, yes, the world is stripped away, but we get more in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, this is what these trials do. Everything of this world will soon fade away. Our lives, our money, all the pleasantries will soon fade away because something better is coming. Notice again what it says here in verse 11. Here in the second half, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. To pursue after riches is a worthless pursuit. It's not true beauty. True beauty is pursuing after Jesus in the world he offers. So brothers and sisters, let us cast our wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where all our possessions lie. Let us see and set our hopes on the promised land, the new and better Jerusalem. Let us trust in God's promises that he is preparing us to bring us to the other side. That's where our hope comes from. Christian, that is our hope. That's why we count it all joy as we come through these various trials. Because God is not preparing us to live life and live it now in this world. He's preparing us for the life to come where sickness and sorrow and death are no more. Brothers and sisters, that's worthy of having great joy. Because that's what we're looking for in the Christian life. That's what we're being prepared for. Maybe you're here this morning and you hear us talk about counting it all joy. Maybe you think we're a little crazy as Christians. No, we might be partially right. We might be a little crazy, and we certainly are strange to this world, and that's okay. But friend, if, if this is you and you have yet to come to this place of faith this morning, let me invite you to hear this truth. You particularly. These Christians count trials as joy. Yes, because of these reasons, because we put our hope in what God has promised to come. But we also know the way that we have life in the first place is by the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ came, He left glory, and came to this world and took on our human flesh. He became like us and suffered like us. Think about it. Jesus himself faced hunger and thirst. He faced suffering and even faced death in the cruelest of forms. He faced death on a Roman cross. A death that Roman citizens couldn't even have. It was that cruel. Jesus was nailed to that cross for our sins and our transgressions. He suffered and bled and died so that we could have life. He suffered for us. So, us facing these sufferings of this world, it's with this hope of true life that we do it with. That's why we come to joy. Look at verse 12 here. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. 
This life is what we know we've been promised in Christ. So, friend, if you are not a believer this morning, know that this crown of life is even being extended to you if you will repent and believe in Jesus. If you will believe that His death on the cross was sufficient to pay for your sins and your transgressions, that life comes through Him and Him alone. That life can be yours. That hope of eternal life can be yours. And Christian, let that crown of life, that which we are promised, be what drives us to persevere in the faith. Let us keep pressing on, counting our trials as joy as we are made ready for that true and better life, that life which is truly precious in God's eyes, that life that will not fade away. Brothers and sisters, let us count all trials as joy. There's a problem here. And this is where James goes and where we now turn in our second point this morning. Temptations and death. If God sovereignly orchestrates trials for our good, then does God orchestrate and sovereignly deem and give us temptation? The answer is here. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Friends, the, the danger here as we lift up the sovereignty of God is to think that God is so sovereign, he's also the cause of temptation. But he is not the author of evil. It comes within our sinful self. It's from our own evil desires is where this temptation comes. Look at this, how this continues to unfold. Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Now it's not lost on me where I am, where our, our setting is. Many of you up here are fishermen or have fishermen in your family. Think about the waters that you cast into the waters of the lake, whether it be summer or winter in ice this fish and you're you're going to have to convince me you're not crazy on that, by the way. But think about the words you use to lure the fish out, to lure them to take the bait. This is what our desire does. It lures us into acting on that desire. It's by this that sin and temptation come. It's from the desires within, the desires for pride, the desires for sexual immorality, the desires for all sorts of sin. Consider some of the sins here that James hits on. That of anger, partiality, adultery, hate, jealousy, selfish ambition, quarrels, and self-indulgence. These are the sin issues the letter of James is going to hit on as we move our way over the next six remaining weeks in this study. Each of these is going to be hit. These temptations are not from God. They're from within our own sinful self. We want to be right so we quarrel and we fight. We want to be focused on self and so these things come. But they don't come suddenly. They start quietly within our hearts and our minds. They start working their way up. And often, if we're not careful, we allow them just to manifest and to grow. But the problem is, as these sinful desires grow within us, eventually they're going to come out. Notice the comparison here, used here in verses 14 and 15. Each person is, is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Ladies, think about your pregnancy. Nine months, yes, it may feel like eternity, but eventually, Lord willing, that baby comes out. It's born. It doesn't remain within. That sinful desire, it doesn't remain in. It works its way out as it grows in us and comes out of us into sin. <laughs> But that sin doesn't just remain a baby. It, it grows. And when it's fully grown, death. 
Friends, we must beware of the temptations and the desires of our own heart. The world wants to tell us to follow our hearts, to follow our desires, and that is what is good. Christian, that is a foolish guide. It will kill us if we're not careful. We must beware of the desires and temptations of our heart because our desires, when given over to them, they will lead us to sin and eventually death. It will lead us from trusting in Jesus and trusting in those desires. Brothers and sisters, we must battle this. Young people especially. I want you to think about this. You, some of you in here are, are much younger than I. And you think, oh, I've got time. I can dabble in sin right here, right now. But hear me. As you dabble in sin, as you allow that sin to manifest in that heart, it's like a cobra squeezing you. It's suffocating you little by little until you cannot breathe. And then you suffocate and die. That's how temptation works within our hearts to squeeze the life out of us as we act upon it and give in to it. Christian, you must put this to death. Young person, you must put these temptations to death now before they choke the life out of you. Here you are in the Christian faith. Maybe you think, oh, I still got plenty of time. Take sin seriously. Because if we're not killing, to, to paraphrase the Puritan John Owen, we must be killing sin. Our sin will kill us. And we must fight and kill the temptations and desires of our heart that lead to sin and death. That's the whole of the Christian life. We're conforming more to Jesus as we grow in holiness and godliness. Temptations and trials are different. Though they are play on words, they are different. Trials are from God for our good. Temptations are a sinful working of our own hearts. Brothers and sisters in Jesus, let us see the difference. Let us rejoice in the trials that come our way to test us and to conform us to God. And let us fight and kill and desire and sin within us so it does not kill us. But how? How do we do this? How do we put this sin to death? That's where we turn in our third and final point this morning. God and goodness. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Brothers and sisters, we should not be deceived. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. It comes down and is a gift from God, our Father. He gives those good and perfect gifts to us, namely His Son, Jesus Christ, who has already laid down His life for us. So how do we battle temptations of our heart? How do we continue to persevere in the faith? Well, we look to the goodness of God. We look and are reminded that every good gift is from Him. Look again there at 17. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Think back to creation in its origin. It was good. It was good. It was good. God does not create that which is not good, or he would cease to be God. God is a good God who creates good things. And that's what he's doing in our Christian life. He's recreating us back to his perfect image, to be good in his image once more as new creatures, walking in Jesus. And as he does this, he's not going to change. He's not all of a sudden one day going to be a God who creates goodness and all of a sudden now be a God who creates goodness. Even just average, God is creating us and recreating us to make us new in Jesus. Look at verse 18. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 
Think about this. Now remember, this letter is written with a real context, a historical setting. It was written some 2,000 years ago in the year 40 AD, 0040. 2,000 later, this book is speaking. God is unchanging in that time, and his word of truth has been bringing forth fruit. James. The author of this book, those he wrote to who endured in the faith. That person who led you to faith is evidence of others who have gone before us and bore fruit, and other fruit has come from it. God is producing fruit in order to sustain us and to carry us through until the very end. This is God's goodness to us. Christian. And as you think about these trials and temptations, know that our good God, what He begins, He will complete. And He's going to continue to grow His kingdom, both in us and those who have yet to hear and believe. But brothers and sisters, we're going to stumble along the way. We're going to stumble in this. And this is one of the beauties of the local church. This is why we need one another. This is why it, you're going to hear me probably get on this a lot as pastor. Church membership matters. Why? Because it takes us and makes us commit to not only a, a building and put our name on a church roll. That's not what church membership is about. Church membership is about us as people making a commitment to one another and saying, when you're struggling to remember this, when you're struggling in temptation, you're accountable to me and I am to you. And we're going to strengthen one another. We're going to call out this temptation and help you fight it. We're going to point you back to this goodness of God so that you can remember it. So that you can be reminded. That's the beauty of church membership. That's why we join and commit ourselves to the local church so that we make that mutual commitment and covenant together and say, brother, sister, I've got your back. Do you have mine? Do you have my back to remind me of God's goodness when suffering strikes, when trials strike? Do you have my back to call me out when sin and temptation are tugging at my heart and I'm about to be choked out by them? Do you do you have my back to tell me, brother, you're in sin. Flee from it. Brothers and sisters, do we see, as James sets up this letter, that trials and temptations are both working. They're working, one for our good, one for our harm. But we need to remember God's goodness as we battle with Him. Brothers and sisters, let's be a people who embrace our trials, knowing that they are working for our good, in people who are killing sin, knowing that sin will kill us if we allow it to manifest and grow, and we will be a people who remember the goodness of God, that He is the one who has given us every good and perfect gift from above, being His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for Your grace to us in Jesus. God, we pray, Lord, that as we continue to study through this letter of James, Lord, that we would count our trials as joy and be a people who walk faithfully, fleeing from sin instead of allowing it to manifest in us. God, help us, because we need your strength. We need your wisdom to go about this. In Jesus' name we pray.